and we're back. Welcome, everybody. It is Sunday. It's time for our fireside chat. And this time we have a special guest. As everybody knows, I am Joanne Wallace, the angel of Angel Citadel. With me is my loving and wonderful husband. Josh Wallace, Count Zero ASL, the one and only. And today we have Eldritch Crow. Eldritch Crow is the designer of the game Ether, which we just reviewed on angelscitadel.com. So, a lovely review. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, talk to us. Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me. I appreciate it so, so much. I know I said that before stream starts, but, um, you know, I'm still, like, even though I have friends who are much bigger in terms of following than I, mm -hmm. I still am somewhat small, and I'm lucky to know a lot of designers in this space, um, but getting eyes on a game is really tough. So having folks who just come in swinging saying, yeah, let's do a review. Let's have you on a stream. Let's do all this stuff is so helpful to people like me, <laughs> you know, even just beyond like a retweet or getting shout outs and stuff like that. It's, you know, being, having the opportunity to talk about it and why something exists is infinitely, infinitely more useful, especially for people looking to try new games, I think. Because now we have just so much information out there about it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. We are happy to have you. You bet. So I'll go ahead and get started, just because. <laughs> um, I've, I've talked on streams before about I've been playing for a long time. And I'm, I'm not going to ask how long you've been playing, because let's face it. No one really cares. Um, <laughs> it doesn't you know, really matter. For, for me either. But what I'm interested in is, so I've been, like I said, I've been playing for like 30 years now. And recently, both Joanne and I have kind of made that jump from player GM to game designer, supplement designer, you know, stuff like that. Why did you, what, what made you make that jump? Oh, that is, you're getting into the <laughs> spicy stuff already. Um, hey, I, I don't hold punches, man. <laughs> so no, it's great. This is one of my favorite things to talk about actually, because it kind of highlights some stuff um, about why I design things the way I do. Um, so in the past couple of years, you know, there's been a big panorama going on. I've also had a lot of personal life things happen and, you know, I was doing a master's degree, which I just finished this past week, actually, which is great. Way to go. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's finally just off my plate and it's nice. Um, but I've been in that the entire, you know, panorama as well. Um, but I also came out as bi and I came out as non-binary and those were sort of two, you know, learning moments because now all of a sudden... I am at least somehow part of communities I didn't know or didn't think I was a part of before. So learning experience there. And then I also realized that like I was playing D and D exclusively at the time and I was mostly running it for one specific group of friends that I adore. And I was in that space of having to homebrew a lot of stuff because we were playing a very JRPG inspired campaign of course, I was adding stuff like airship rules, and I was a little bit frustrated with the way D&D &D does social encounters, so I was coming up with mechanics for that. Uh, I say D&D &D does social encounters. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> which is not a fault of the system, in my opinion. It's just focused on other things. So, you know, the social element of it uh, suffers for it, and that's fine. But I reached a point where um, when... Stuff started coming out about Watsi's business choices and how they were treating some of their marginalized uh, freelancers and, you know, the hires they were bringing on board. I just reached a point where I realized between that and stuff going on in the community, okay, the stuff I would want to bring on and design probably wouldn't be welcome here. Just in general. Okay. And that was... 
you know, part of it was I was getting into the safety tools element of things at the time. I was getting into, okay, well, how do I bring sort of this lens of a newly out queer person to design as well and all these different things? And I just eventually realized, you know, I had a dream of working for WOTC, as I'm sure many people do, and I realized that just wasn't going to happen. It's not their fault. It's not my fault. It's just not what would be in the cards. Um, and that was a rough realization, you know, but at the same time, it was a realistic one. And so I realized, like, all right, this happened, and then... <laughs> More stuff came out about Watsi's business decisions, and I was like, okay, I really can't keep playing this game. I just, I can't keep giving them money, and I can't keep giving them my time. So I sat there, and I was like, all right, well, I've got vehicle rules, and I've got social rules, and I've got ideas for, you know, core resolution. I basically have a game in my head, so let's put my money where my mouth is, and let's write one. Fast forward two years, and you have Ether 1.5. Okay. Direct line. Um, so it was a lot of just sitting there and being like, all right, D&D is not doing what we need it to do for the games we play. It was a great system to start with. It helped us fine tune, like with this particular group, the experience we like. So now I'm going to go basically make a system for my friends. I never anticipated selling it at first. And now we're here. And now we're here. Uh, and now we're here. <laughs> Yeah. So that's it, really. That was the transition point for me. I, I like... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I like how personal that was. What I mean is... You... You did it for you. You did it for your friends, right? And that's awesome. Yeah, the whole um, system is a love letter to the style of game that me and this is actually like my first home group that I've played with. We met weirdly, you know, you hear all the horror stories about like online groups meeting through Facebook and stuff uh -huh. like that. We were one of those groups and we've been playing together for four years. And just it stuck. <laughs> See, we're not alone. No, we're not. <laughs> uh, we met through and started playing together through Reddit. Nice, nice. Yeah, Love just uh, posted uh, Shadowrun yeah, LFG ten years ago. And, nice, uh, nice. I haven't had a chance to play Shadowrun. You're not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it would be very overwhelming because I I prefer um, this might be a weird statement. I prefer math light but mechanics heavy games. <laughs> um, okay. Where I, in that case you might actually enjoy Shadowrun. Because it is mechanic heavy and it is math light. The only thing you add up is it, it's the only thing you add up is the number of dice you're throwing. Oh, and it's then nice it's person. yes, and then it's hits and hits or successes versus hits and successes. Nice. And to get a hit or success in Shadow Run, it's a five or a six. So all you're doing is you're totaling up your number. So you roll your D6s. That's where the joke of the bathtub full of D6s comes from. You roll your D6s. And then the GM rolls the opposing D6s. And then you add up your fives and sixes. And whoever has the most fives and sixes wins. And the bigger the range, the better the success. Yeah. So. That makes sense. So fun fact, Ether started out as a dice pool system. Mm -hmm. um, and that was inspired because of Tidebreaker, which I referenced at the end of the PDF, um, by Nick Butler, aka at follow my blade on Twitter. Um, Nick's a fantastic designer and I love him. Um, but his was the first indie game I got to help playtest. Um, Tidebreaker was fantastic. It influenced a lot of my design decisions in terms of what I like out of games. But the one thing, you know, going back to that personal side of things, the one thing I wanted to keep for my group was they liked doing big plays. They liked rolling a lot of dice. They liked doing all these things and getting big numbers. Um, so I was like, all right, how do we keep that vibe, but just tweak it? So it started out as a dice pool game and then eventually down the line became a card system. But if you notice, most of the mechanics around the game focus on, all right, how do I get to play more cards? And what does that mean? 
because of that idea of, all right, I want that satisfaction of like throwing a fistful of dice, but with a card deck. <laughs> now we're here. Yeah. Yeah. So I noticed that you reference. Um, we only reviewed the mechanic aspect. I noticed that you referenced the safety tools quite a bit. What led you to, I'm going to ask this because I've written an entire article about it. What caused you to want to include it so bad? I know why I wanted to include it. Uh, <laughs> oof. Um, two things. One, after being in the indie space and seeing all the arguments in favor of safety tools, it felt like a no-brainer. Two, also regrets. You know, I've been a GM for a couple of years now, and there's a few moments where I look back and I wish I'd had them. You know, there were points where a game got tense and they would have given us a way, you know, just a doorway to talk about that tension at the table instead of just letting it sit. And, you know, there would have been better ways to process things. And I would have just been a better GM, too. You know, there's a thing that safety tools do once you start incorporating them. And it kind of makes you let go of that GM instinct to hold everything close to the chest and keep everything secret. Because you finally start to learn that, like, you don't need to keep a secret for it to have an impact at the table and have it be fun for everybody. So the game I'm running for that home group right now is a gothic horror campaign. I've never run a horror game before. And I told them straight up from the beginning, all right, this first arc, I'm going to run it like a slasher film. You're going to be dealing with one terrifying thing that you cannot, you know, harm at first. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to figure out the mystery behind it. That so, works. yeah, and it's like you don't have to get super specific with it. You still can leave yourself wiggle room and all that stuff and improvising room. But I have found it much more freeing to just be, you know, all cards on the table, no pun intended, and be like, all right, this <laughs> is what you're going to be dealing with. And then watch them still get surprised and still get freaked out and still get intrigued and interested despite knowing what's coming. It's just, it's very satisfying in my opinion. So yeah, um, two parts, just, it was a no-brainer and I had some, you know, personal memories of when I'd have liked to use them, so I included them. Fine. That jibes with me. I, I used to run a lot of we didn't do so much the horror, but I used to have players that were very focused on the more sexual aspects of the game. Mm-hmm. Yep. And there were quite a few times that I was like, no, we're not doing this. And they were like, but I want to. That's what my character would do. I don't, I don't care what your character would do. If you continue down this path, I'm going to delete you from the group. <laughs> That's what private chats are for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to get into that, like... There's whole communities around those things, just not here. Yes. Please. There are whole communities around that thing, and I'm not going to have that running around with a 16-year-old in the game. Also, it's that. Like, people don't realize, especially with the advent of the internet and being able to play these games online, is like, you, you could wind know. up with an all-ages group, depending on how you're going about finding them. Yeah. You know? I have... It is only in this last... Uh, invisible sun game that I'm playing with Josh that I've only, actually only I have actually had an all adult group before then I would have There's ages running from yeah. 15 up because I ran for teenagers that's what I did I was introducing them to the gaming world and TTRPGs yeah, I'll get and on that soapbox too <laughs> quick, quick shout hey Fesnrax um, so he's one of my cast um, on Invisible Sun, he plays oh, lovely. Hero Heroes. He's awesome. And our friend Fook um, has a lovely YouTube channel that uh, he interviews people and plays uh, Pathfinder. So, nice. Hi, guys. Nice. Pathfinder is a system I've never gotten to dig into, but I do have it. And uh, It's it... an upgraded D&D 3.5. Yeah. Or at least the first um, edition. And then the second edition is similar to D&D 5e. I mean, as it's going to be, they're, they've always been really parallel in terms of their design history. But that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you can see, like, thankfully, uh, you put the uh, ether cover up. 
but I had my cover designer throw a 12 plus graphic on there. And I looked at 12 plus because I was like, all right, I know teenagers are probably going to want to play this. I know there are kids who are probably going to want to play this, but a lot of the safety tools and a lot of the materials here require you to have some kind of sense of self, I guess. Um, you have to have a sense of how you interact with a group. And I felt like, you know, getting into teenagers and, you know, young adults is kind of where you start that process. It's where you finally start to realize like, oh, my actions have impacts beyond myself. So I felt like safety tools included in an RPG focused with that group as the youngest would probably be a good benchmark. Um, and that's just a little thing about why that icon is there. That's a good reason. That's that's a really good point. And, you know, the the idea of communicating those safety tools at that particular age, not so much for the sake of the safety tool itself, but for the idea that, hey, I need to be concerned with what's going on at my table and make sure that everybody's in a position where they can have fun. Not that I we can't broach other topics or whatever, but that we do it with our eyes open. Exactly. I had a, uh, I said a good line um, on another interview I did this past week about Ether. And the line I said was safety tools are there to teach you that um, part of the process is protecting each other's fun, not just participating in each other's fun at the table. Uh, you know, you kind of, we're, we're entering a space now where tabletop games specifically have grown, grown part of me, so far beyond the initial audiences mm -hmm. that now you need these safety tools in place because there's a good chance, you know, you're sitting down at a, a convention when the pandemic is over or you're playing virtually online, that these aren't going to be people you've known for an ex extremely long time. And on top of that, they could still be people you've known for an extremely long time and just not realize what could come up that's not great for them. So having the safety tools in place just makes sure that like, hey, I get to have fun here, but I also get to make sure that the person to my right and to my left have fun. Yeah. That's it. They, they are community like fun protection tools is the way I view them. And they don't have to be um, monolithic or anything like that. It's, no, it's very much. Uh, uh, hey, let's use some common sense and check in with each other. You know? Yeah, like they are they are a doorway to opening up conversations that would normally be much more difficult to have um, because it's hard to broach certain topics of like, hey, I can see, you know, for example, Joanne is uncomfortable at the table, but I don't quite know how to, you know, open that up in the midst of, you know, two other people role playing, mm -hmm. but having an X card to throw or having some other signifier mm -hmm. of like, Hey, we need to take a pause for a moment and wrangle each other is just a thing that opens up the space to make sure everybody is okay. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to turn this into a major safety tools tangent, but like, no, I I, what did we say about tangents? Tangents are okay. <laughs> what? True. So, I wrote an entire blog uh, article about the use of safety tools. And I got called and told that I was, what, a social justice, justice warrior, warrior yep. <laughs> who had no idea what the hell I was talking about and that I had probably never actually played any games. And it was just this massive. It brings so many strange people out of the woodwork. And yeah. it's like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> are you fucking kidding me right now? I am a female who started playing back when it was almost entirely male dominated. You've got the first hand experience. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And you better believe that if I had had safety cards like that, a lot fewer people would have gotten bitch slapped. And like, there's also, <laughs> there's that, but like, imagine 
how much more comfortable you would have been playing. And I imagine you've done that frequently is just like sitting down at the table and saying, all right, I, I would have felt so much safer having a recourse for certain things, knowing that certain things were off the table. Um, me as like, I consider myself a very young queer person because I came to that realization a little bit later than a lot of folks do. Um, but it's the same idea of like, oh, I'm an openly bisexual, you know, usually male presenting person. So there's a good chance I'm going to run into people who will not like me based on my existence. Um, even within queer circles, because unfortunately biphobia is a really the thing. It's stupid. Um, uh, it I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and weigh in on that. It's stupid. It's especially stupid because they'll be less, they'll be more forgiving of a female being bi than a male being bi. Hmm. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. Accurate. Um, Experienced. So. I, I came yep. out as bi in 98. 1998. And you know what? The only comment I ever got about it. Do you think you and my girlfriend could have a threesome? Specifically from that was it. straight guys? Yeah. Every time. Every time. And it it was just it it wasn't even. It was I'd get hit on by girls. You know, my boyfriend would really love a threesome for his birthday. Are you are you fucking kidding me? Even if I'm bi, I'm way too fucking possessive for Polly. I really am. <laughs> and <laughs> that's those, fair. Uh-uh. What's like, mine is mine. There's also a thing, too, of, like, or, this is a strange perception I've run into, but by women are hot, by men are a threat. Just don't. I, I and mean, I don't know maybe, why. I, I don't. I mean, there's also it. the whole thing of like men in general have a presence in society that uh, we are constantly punching above our weight class, uh, so to speak, socially. But you know, it's still strange. So having safety tools as like looping this back in as a newly bi person who is stepping into spaces I've never been in before. Having safety tools for who I play with is super important because, like, I don't know if the person across from me is going to be totally chill about things. So here we are, and I gotta, I have to have ways to navigate that because I'm also a person who's neurodivergent. Like, I've got an anxiety disorder specifically around social scenarios. So for me to have that and the, the safety tools kind of just become posts and defenses against these things you know they are an answer to a question that question being how do we deal with friction at the table most of the time that comes down to just talk about it the safety tools make it easier to talk about it so i'd rather have them and not need them personally yeah and that's i that. actually have no idea if it i have i have never i we recently got an itch that I owe, but okay. I've never actually used it, so I have no idea. As someone who sells exclusively on Edgefook, yes, you can. Um, so basically, when you set up a project on Itch, you are allowed to set um, a no cost, a pay what you want, or a specific price. So, for example, um, Ether is set with the option of a minimum price. So people can tip me more than the, you know, $35 regular price if they feel like it's worth that much. I have other stuff up. Um, for example, I, I drafted up a basic freelancer contract because I know some contract language. And a lot of people have trouble figuring out where to get started with that sort of thing when they just get their start freelancing. And so I just posted a basic template and set that at pay what you want. So people can pay me nothing for it and just download it, but they have the resource. Or they can pay me 10 bucks or 20 bucks and just, you know, whatever they feel comfortable with. So, yeah, you can absolutely do that on itch, especially if it's Creative Commons. You know, usually Creative Commons stuff is 
pretty pretty safe to put out there, especially on itch as well. Um, as long as you're not infringing on somebody else's copyright with it. Go ahead. So for those of you uh, out there just joining us, uh, we are interviewing Eldris Crow, the creator of Ether. Uh, just threw his uh, itch.io store page into chat. Ah, uh, so thank you so much. Take a look Appreciate at that. Uh, what he's got on offer as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, we've talked a lot about safety tools. We've talked a lot about uh, why one gets into game design. Card games. No, so, no, no, no. Okay, fine. no, no. I have a question. Fine. Okay. <laughs> so, because so, we're talking, we're still talking about game design. I have a question. Did you design the layout for your book, or did you have somebody else do it? I learned layout specifically to do the one that's in the book right now. When I okay. take this to uh, crowdfunding. I have a layout artist uh, who is also someone I consider a friend who I want to pay to do it because I've hit a point where like my layout skills would require me doing layout as a job to get any better. Um, and <laughs> I so I need to good. pay someone who can do layout as a job in order for it to get any better. Um, so, and, and there's a reason why I'm asking that because what I, what I'm trying to understand is the way you decided your color scheme. I am curious. Oh. So, uh, if, if you followed us, I did the layout for Hope's Horizon, which was our product. It's available on Drive Through. I'm sure mm -hmm. you've seen it everywhere because Josh puts it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the big things that I want that I like learning is why people choose the colors and choose the designs that they do. So, um, I would like to ask you. I'm addicted to purple. <laughs> and so I chose color scheme entirely based on what complements that. Uh, and I, outside of just saying, hey, I want kind of a purple and a blue gradient color scheme, I just let my cover artist go. Um, because my cover artist uh, did both the background for the cover and did the emblem you see. Um, and so, okay. uh, by the way, um, my artist was. Uh, Lord, I can't remember their name. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Let me go to Twitter real fast. Uh, at Kythena Draws. Um, Catherine oops. Demers. Yes. Cover and promo materials by. <laughs> yes, and... I have your PDF up on my screen as I'm looking at it. because. Oh, you are infinitely more prepared than I am then. <laughs> uh, we try. <laughs> I try. Doesn't always work, but we try. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's why I wanted to know, like the cute little the loops that you did on the side with the boxes. Those you super. Yeah. Those like um. <laughs> those were a pain to make because I had to like snip different shapes by hand to get those, and then layer everything, and it was a nightmare. But it turned out pretty nice, in my opinion. But yeah, yeah. color scheme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was me going to Katie and saying like, hey, I have this idea for the logo. Color scheme is just real basic, these two things. You know, I want a purple and a blue gradient. And I just turned Katie loose, and the cover you see is what happened. <laughs> um, Katie has a wonderful design sense, and I absolutely adore the work that was done. Um, I actually have plans to get the uh, logo for Ether as my first tattoo. Just because I love that design so so much. It's that a would very be cool a tattoo. Yeah, yeah. I basically just wanted as like a forearm tattoo, but. All right. Look, the only way I'm getting a tattoo is if I get the wings on my back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, we've had long discussions about tattoos. And then there was a real funny moment where I realized entirely by accident, I basically made my cover um, most of the color scheme from the Bi Pride flag, even though that was never the intention. <laughs> uh, but that's how it turned out. So it was a funny I coincidence. Break it up, but yes, yes, you did. And I thought it was a really awesome thing. Yeah, I love it. 
I, I, I definitely like the gradients you did on the pages. Yeah, those wound up just being a kind of a happy accident. Uh, again, I had Katie do some early promotional material for me, and the actual page background is just the background from the cover with the background from one of the promo images that Katie did for me layered over it. So that's why you have that really nice, like, blue-toned off-white going on. And it just all worked very nicely together by coincidence. I hadn't planned on it, but here, you know, here it is. And it worked out. Um, can, I also just say, I'll tell you. Can, I, can I also just say, the engineer in me jumped for joy at the flowcharts. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> I, so the flowcharts were in addition specifically for 1.5, and I wish I had been smart enough to have them there since the beginning of the game. It's life. Fantastic. I love it. Um, it's just, it makes things so much easier, even for me, trying to explain how certain processes work. They're so nice. They're so good. Um, more games need flowcharts, in do. my opinion. Yes, um, they do. <laughs> If you want our game to have a flowchart, then you're gonna fucking do it. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I'm doing all the other stuff. You that, can, you that sounds like a challenge. I will. <laughs> I will draw it out on the back of a napkin for you to make look pretty. All right. As I mean, long as I've work. got something to work from, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and the one thing I learned um, from, gosh. Actually, I don't remember where I learned it from. One thing I learned uh, was when you have an artist do work for you, specifically color work, ask them for a palette. You know, ask them to just drop, you know, what color it is and the hex code onto, you know, a document or whatnot for you. So that if you take that project to other artists, they have something to go off of. Mm -hmm. So all of my, like, layout work, I've been able to use the same color scheme exactly because I had the list of hex codes. Nice. Thanks to Katie. And it's been a lifesaver. Like, I've not only been able to use those hex codes for that stuff, but, like, when I was designing my own stream uh, overlays and stuff, I went ahead and used those hex codes again because I use a lot of that color scheme in all of my stuff, and I enjoy it very much. So I just went with it. Um, and it just, it's so much easier. Whenever you commission an artist to do color work, ask for a color palette, even if you got to pay extra for it. Okay. Random things you don't think about. Yeah. I. It's yeah. just so much. Char told us to do the same thing when we were developing Hope's Horizon. I had to give her our color palette so that she could build the character sheet. Yeah, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I've slept since then. <laughs> so, uh, because of the amount of information I was having to learn when I was learning layout, like you... Um, and did Hope's Horizon, I sourced out building the character sheet for Hope's Horizon, and I ended up giving her the color palette to where the color palette would match, the colors on the character sheet would match the layout design I was doing. Makes sense. Yeah. And then she decided she was going to clean up our logo and make it look pretty. <laughs> Which is very nice of her. Um, I honestly... Designing character sheets and extra ephemera like that is, it's an art form in its own. And I, I like, I designed the character sheets for Ether and I've redesigned every character sheet for Ether because I'm broke and I don't have the money to pay people for that kind of thing. Um, so I went through and trimmed it all down and did these things. And it takes a while to get to something that is both functional and aesthetically pleasing. You know, yes. I would. Yes, it does. <laughs> I would say 1.5. This is the first time I've had a character sheet that is like good looking on the page. Um, Ironically, earlier today, Joanne was working on the beginnings of one of our character packets for uh, our our game. So you understand. Yes, <laughs> it's, I... it's so much R and D, like. So many versions, so many small tweaks of like moving one thing over like a couple pixels and then it sets everything else off on the page and it's like, ah, but the one element looks better, so now I gotta move everything else over to match it and uh. See, he feels my pain. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and then 
And so what was really funny is that, so I don't know what you're using, but I use Affinity. Oh my god. Yes. One yes. Fuck Photoshop. <laughs> Cause yes. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay a monthly fee for Photoshop. I, I like my Affinity. I've got all three Affinity products, so I started. So I'm using Affinity, and then Josh was sitting over here watching me use it, and you've seen how complicated it looks. Cause I had all these little tabs open, cause parts of it are tables and parts of it are this. So I had my little table window open. Yes, fuck Photoshop. It's a horrible, horrible thing, and it's stupidly expensive. For no reason, because you've got to pay a subscription fee, and what is it like fifty bucks a month? Yeah, yeah. And you don't own it, and you don't own it. It stops working. But if you pay fifty bucks once, you get Affinity Publisher, and you get all the updates for free. It's yours, and it has just as many bells and whistles. Yeah, and there's like some small variants in like the different tools you can use, but that's because Affinity has just had a shorter life cycle than Photoshop and similar programs for now. Like once it hits that critical mass of having been out long enough, it'll be just as feature rich, I'm sure, and I'm happy to have it. But yeah, there's so many things to just move and make tiny adjustments to in those programs, and it's just, oh. Yeah, and then he was watching me, and he he watched me, and I, I, because, so part of our design is that we're going to have, to limit the number of dice, we're going to have dots, right? Kind of like Blades in the Dark. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there, and I made my little dots, and then I selected them on, grouped them, and he's like watching me do this, and he's like, why are you doing that? And it's because... Now I can resize them, and they'll all resize at the same time. Grouping yep. is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's how I um, I recently released, because the one really, or two really huge changes I made for 1.5 were I entirely ripped out and redid core resolution, and then I changed encounter rules, because I had basically two different systems for different types of encounters. And then I figured out a way to do it where you only need to learn one set of rules to run any kind of encounter you want. But it required me going and making a progress tracker. So I had to go and make a little like checkbox experience bar for this progress tracker. The copy and paste and group functions saved my life. Yep. Just because then I just grouped the entire bar into one layer and was able to move it and resize it despite it being like 20 boxes and a bunch of weirdness and it was just uh such a lifesaver being able to do that and then i got the chance to segment it and use it in later parts of the sheet as well because i had it all grouped together nicely that was another thing aside from the flow charts the the fact that you had so many usable materials like not just the character sheets but the encounter boxes and the stat blocks and the the players cheat sheet and all that it reminded me very much of the the packets like from blades in the dark and scum and villainy and, mm -hmm. and all those and games where there's so much in that packet that if you've gone through the rules you can just sit down and play with that paper basically and that was a goal because I was playtesting this with friends, and, you know, these were friends who primarily knew D&D, &D, so I wanted to make it as easy for them to pick up the new system as possible. So that was, you know, where the player cheat sheet come, came from, uh, that idea, which became so much easier to do once I had flowcharts, because mm -hmm. then all I had to do was open two affinity files and copy and paste the entire flowchart. It was wonderful. <laughs> um, and I just got to do it all in-house, basically. But the other side of that, too, was it was partially my frustrations as a game runner coming through because, dear God, D&D is bad at teaching you how to run games uh, at the box. And so not having any guidance on that, I spent, you know, two plus years running games. And so all of my frustrations show through in, OK, what problems does my GM packet immediately solve out the gate for players? <laughs> And that is, all right, here's a basic structure. If you've never run a game before, 
Here are sheets where you can just paint by numbers to run a session and run a campaign. Here's a sheet where you can paint by numbers to run creatures and encounters. Have fun. And that's it. Like, I, I, love, I, I flat out love it. I love when people do that for GMs. You know, if you want somebody to pick up your game and run it, and they've never done it before, and they don't have you to teach them, and they may not, you know, learn or teach very well themselves, to have that packet that they can give out to their players while they're running the game so everybody's on the same page, that's huge. Mm Mm-hmm. It's... Honestly, and that was one of the main goals, too, is like once I decided on selling the game, I knew I had to put a big focus on, OK, I need to I need this to be teachable and runnable without me present. And the sheets are me trying to do that. I also have plans for hopefully doing a basically an audiobook version, um, you know, getting my own audio files out there for it. And potentially uh, originally when I did. 1.1 and 1.2, I had videos up running through stuff like character creation. But so much has changed since then that I have to go and redo them. So at some point, when I have the brain cells, uh, I'll go back and do that. But Yeah, uh, my, <laughs> my frustrations with not having direction GMing is so... Um, so much of why I designed Ether the way I did. Uh, oh, Luke. Um, Crow with two W's because somebody else already had Eldritch Crow with one W, and Eldritch Crow is my screen name in general because of a very, very bad pun I made during a D&D game that nobody got, nobody found funny, but I thought it was hilarious, so I changed my Twitter name to it for a week, and then it just stuck. Do you um, share? Oh, yes, you have to share after oh. that. Gosh, I can't even share it because, like, the pun doesn't function if you weren't there for it. But basically, um, there was a really funny thing, a thread in game I had of a character being mistaken for someone else whose nickname was the Raven. So I called him the Crow because crows are always mistaken for ravens. And then things spiraled out from there and nobody found it funny in my home group, but it was fine. Um, because it was funny to me, and that's all that matters. I like that. Um, and then, yeah, it turned into that for, it turned into a joke for a week, and then that joke turned into good branding. Um, uh, yeah, you really can't, like, branding is the hardest part of being any kind of personal creator, so... Coming up with a joke name that turns into its own logo and everything. I'll I'll take it. Yeah. Every day of the week. Bet. Yeah, I didn't have to do that. Somebody else came up with the name. Great. <laughs> so yeah, mine, mine wasn't mine wasn't anywhere near that funny. It was it was more tragic, but uh, you know. Um but yeah, uh, getting into like the branding side of things, nobody ever warned me when I made a game that the easy part would be writing it. <laughs> yeah. Mar- marketing sucks. <laughs> yes, it does. Selling yourself is a pain in the butt. <laughs> it really is, especially for somebody who is socially awkward and like just wants to get my game in front of people, but doesn't want to be obnoxious about it. Um... Self-perceived is obnoxious about it, I should point out, because most other people don't see it that way. Uh, But yeah, no, it's hard. Like, marketing sucks. And, you know, I'm prepping to ramp up into hopefully a Kickstarter campaign. And the amount of work leading up to one of those, even just leading up to the launch, is wild. The amount of work you have to do being a creator, making sure you post, you know, daily or at least every other day, so you don't lose engagement. I think I've posted, <sighs> what, once a week? <laughs> Maybe a little more often. A I don't post as much. You're better but, now than you used to be. It's hard. It is. It I'm is. busy. I have shit to do. 
The one thing I pray for <laughs> someone to create is a system that lets me schedule tweets and just lets me hit a repeat on X day button. I have done so much research into things that don't let me do that. Like I have to go in and they'll let me schedule multiple days or multiple weeks, but it won't let me set a repeating promo tweet. Yeah. And it's such a pain. Like the only reason why I have repeatable promos so easily is because one, I went and learned how to do small animations to make my own gifts. And two, I have a stream deck. And because I have a stream deck, I mapped all of my promo tweets to one button. So anytime I sit down at my computer, I click a button and three tweets fire off. And that's wow. it. And that's just because I'm neurodiverse. I have anxiety. I have potentially ADHD. And I have a terrible memory. So unless I make it as quick and easy as possible for me to promo, I'm not going to remember to do it. That makes Spoiler. sense. I write this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you have a means, if you have a stream deck or any kind of other macro pad, there should be a way for you to set up, um, you know, just establish tweets inside of it and set them all to a single command. Um, and then I created GIFs because I was actually working on making my own stream transition. Uh, and then I realized, wait, this is also the basis of having to make a GIF. So I should just go make promo GIFs. Because they're fun and GIFs notoriously get more attention algorithm wise on Twitter. So I just went and I made a promo GIF for everything that I do. So I made one for my itch page. I made one for my Ko-Fi. I made one for hiring me to do game design stuff. And I just post them all whenever I feel the need. And it's great. I love it. Um, and it just makes my life so easy. <laughs> Define it. Yeah, Fook asked the question. It's like, okay, define it. How do I describe it? Define it. Itch.io? What you're selling or giving away? I, I, oh, um... I <laughs> so, Fook, um... I'm selling uh, tabletop RPGs on itch. Um, it's just a platform is a different question of how I would describe. Mm. It's itch is... an indie platform for people to produce for people who have produced items to sell. Origi it is similar to drive through RPG. Originally it was for distribution of indie video games, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. And so it started out as a platform for indie video games and still very much is like that is very much the core of its platform. But once people found that it had a back end that made it very easy to produce digital goods and sell them for various prices and do, you know, fun things like fulfilling Kickstarter rewards with it and so on. And it just had a natural sort of framework that was great for tabletop games. You know, and digital products in general. I see people doing books and stuff through it now, too. So yeah. it just, it makes things so easy. Like, it has a means to generate download codes. It has a means to, you know, set up a sale page and all this stuff. And it can keep track of all that for you. Um, I think it takes so a smaller portion than drive through does. Uh, you get to set the portion that it takes, actually, which is very nice. Baseline, it takes less as well. But you can set that point to zero, which I've done because I don't have a another job currently, so I need all the money I can get. Um, and I've decided that like once I have consistent income, I'll bump that portion back up to support the platform. But until then, you know, you do what you gotta do, right? Yep. So there's a lot to get started on itch in terms of, you know, setting the cut and making sure you can get payouts if you're selling stuff. And all those things, but once you have it set up, it becomes a very easy and direct platform to use, and it has a lot of options for just doing small extras that make your life so much better as a seller. Now, you can't do, like, physical goods from Itch. Uh, you know, yes, you can. Not really, do you? 
Um, they don't have they don't have print services or anything like that, so you would have to print it yourself. But they do have the means to collect the shipping information for those goods. Ah, okay. So, yeah. so if we wanted to do, if I wanted to make stuff here and then sell it via itch, we then I could. That. Or if we if we did like a, a what's that self planning house that I sent you, dude. Do you have any um, idea how much stuff you've sent me? Not, not who. Uh, Stress with an H. Which one do you send it to? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Um, Lulu. 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 It Lulu matter. starts with an H. Apparently, it it, it does. Anyway, um, so we can sell print through Lulu, ship it to our house, and then ship it somewhere else. You could do something like that, but that's kind of a pain in the neck. Yeah, but other people have done it. I'm not going to do it, but other people have done it. But it would make sense, like, if you do... I don't know, jewelry or whatever. You could do a itch.io store. Yeah. That'd be easier route. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, itch.io is a indie platform for selling yep. typical games. So that's how you would describe it. And personally, it, it's... There are things that I would love to see change about itch, but it's probably the most, I would say, egalitarian platform out there currently for selling tabletop games and related materials, in my opinion. Um, and until other platforms kind of reach a saturation point, it's the best we've got. Drive through isn't bad. You you can use drive through and you can set it up similar to the ways, but they still if you make money they take a cut. Yeah, they take a cut, and I've also found that like their back end was a bit clunkier. So when I was doing research into what platform to use, drive through was on the list. But I just the interface for itch is what got me. Okay. It's so cleanly organized, just because it kind of had to be to be able to juggle everything that game developers, you know, video game developers need to deal with. Uh, hey, you intern. do that. I do all the other stuff. You get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we um, set up Pups Horizon, he set it up to be sold through drive through And yeah, that we we basically have split up how we do things, which makes it nice to be working together. Which makes perfect sense, and I applaud you both. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had a second me most days to just handle other sides of the work because then one of me could just sit there and write and then the other me could do all the less fun things but no it's just me there are days that I could wish I wish I could like triplicate me because then I'd get a lot of stuff done <laughs> and it's like it's kind of strange too because I, I hit that feeling this past week of oh god there's so many things like I've got three projects lined up for either I have a, a an unnamed expansion I want to do that is player abilities, you know, extra examples, extra skills, and uh, GMless play options. I need to update one of the current expansions to just make it flow with the new encounter rules, and then I want to do a bestiary. I had all last week to get started on these things, and I've done none of them. Uh, <laughs> Because I finished my thesis, I sent it off, and then I was just like, okay, my brain's shutting off now. And it just has That's not come okay. back online. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes yeah. you need that time to reset. And absolutely, but there's, what I'm getting at is there's a funny amount of work that we don't consider work. That is absolutely work. You know, two interviews this week making sure you two and the other interviewer had all the information that you needed so you could talk about things. Um, doing stuff like booking a booster shot, like all of that is work. It just mm -hmm. doesn't register to your brain. And then at the end of the day, I'm sitting there wondering why I'm tired. And I'm like, dude, you finished a degree this week and did all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're wondering why you're tired. 
go to sleep. Uh, and like we we mentioned this briefly before stream, but like the amount of work that goes into a TTRPG that nobody talks about, even supplements and things. So yeah, like, let's talk about that, please. Yes. go for it. I cannot begin to describe how much of my work is sitting here and thinking. Mm -hmm. Or thinking about TTRPGs while I go do other things. Mm -hmm. Or scrambling to find my phone or a notepad to write down an idea that I'm probably not going to use for six months. But in six months' time, I'm really going to need that idea. Um, and it's just, like, I cannot tell you how much sleep I've lost to core resolution. To figuring out abilities. And nobody counts that as work. Nope. No, they don't. And it, um, it's funny because we we do the same thing, and so um, you know I've got a, a smartphone, and and she's got a smartphone, and we've got our computers and stuff like that, and all our stuff is in Google Docs, so that she can edit it, and I can edit it, and we can edit it at the same time, and all of that gets collected in a semi-permanent fashion so that six months down the road when we've forgotten that we've written this down, we've still got it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and like, it's so necessary because I can't tell you how many times I have pulled something out of an old version of Ether and then reintroduced it in a new version in a new way and it's solved a problem. It just wouldn't have solved that problem in its old form. You know, you need to keep absolutely everything on hand and every idea you have because you never know when it's going to come in handy. But that also takes just a lot of like mental RAM. Yes, it does. To do that, like it is, you literally can burn calories just thinking about things sometimes. It's, it feels a bit silly to say, but it's true. Of course. So really a whole lot of fun when you're driving along and you suddenly get this brilliant idea and you got to pull over to where you can write it down. Yep. <laughs> There's that. Um, my favorite is the, uh, oh God, I've just woken up from a dream where I solved this problem. Now I need to write it down before I forget it. Um, I've had that happen multiple times where I have been like almost asleep or not, or like just after falling asleep. I have shot up like straight out of bed and been like, damn, that's a good idea. And just swiped my phone off my desk because thankfully my bed is like two feet from my desk. So I'm never far from a writing implement of some kind. Mm -hmm. And so I've just been like, all right, phone, uh, try to avoid spelling mistakes in this idea. So I understand it later. And only one eyes open. Okay. And then go back to sleep. <laughs> And like, yeah, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of even just like hours of the day taken up by mulling over an idea and nobody, you're never, you're never going to get paid for those hours. You know, as a designer, you don't get those hours back. Part of doing that is because it won't leave your brain alone. And part of doing that is because some part of you enjoys it as masochistic as it can be. Why? <laughs> so everything everything i've heard about typical creators right the artists the musicians the writers the you know whatever they all have that demon you know the one that's sitting on their shoulder and is constantly making them think about whatever it is that they're going to be working on the next sculpture, the next painting, the next book, the next song, the next, whatever. Mm -hmm. And TTRPG writers, TTRPG designers, is the same way. Absolutely. We're, we're, we've got that demon on our shoulder. That's, that's continually teasing us by saying, Hey, you don't have this quite right. what did you, why don't you think about this? Or why don't you think about this other? Or why don't you develop this some more? <laughs> that demon's a bastard and owes me rent. Um, <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> Listen, I don't, I don't like landlords. I'm fucking fucking right. <laughs> from this one, from this one, because like I look back, I released Ether in uh, not this past November, but the year before. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So it's been out a little over a year at this point, and I have put out five major system updates for it since, like from 1.0 to 1.5, and I did those all within a year. There are studios that don't do a single major overhaul like that for a system in a year. Yeah. There are studios that release a brand new product with 37 pages of errata. Exactly. Yes, I'm so pissed about it. Oh gosh. I will take that to my grave. Should I you? <laughs> so Catalyst released Shadow Run 6th edition. At the same time they dropped the book at Gen Con, they released 37 pages of errata. It's crazy. <laughs> like just just like to, literally just, they were handing the book with a stack of paper. With a stack of paper that was the errata. Like, did you even read it? <laughs> like, I, I understand that studios are also usually bound to release dates and things like that. But, like, just postpone it and reprint it at that point. Like, dear Christ. Um, yeah, I was or, a little hot. That, that's also kind of an indicator to me that, like, they set that release date before they started playtesting and then did an oopsie. Um, never set a release date before you're into the playtesting phase. That That's a thing. Um, hi, mistakes from me, uh, because I released my game unplaytested, um, and I released it for sale unplaytested because I feel like more indie developers should do that because that's a good way to find playtesters, actually. But for studios who have an established product, it's not always a good idea because you have people who have already set expectations. Um, good night, Fook. Thanks for joining us. Um, that's one thing, like, it's kind of a double-edged sword being an indie designer, because on the one hand, you kind of lack a backboard for certain things, and you don't have, you know, a studio to go say, hey, I've done this, what do you think? You know, it's kind of hard to find those people, but at the same time, as an indie designer, I get to sit here and be like, I'm not bound by any marketing team. I don't have to do shit. <laughs> um, I don't have to stick to anything except the obligations for people paying me um, with regards to like Kickstarter obligations and things like that. Um, you know, it's it's that idea of like, I simultaneously don't envy D&D designers for having a studio. But at the same time, I look at them and I'm like, <laughs> suckers. You have to listen to a marketing team. You have to listen to executives. I don't. I can make any decisions I want. And I can. It also has its own pitfalls because some of those decisions can be really, really bad. So, you know, you take the risk. That. (laughs) Yeah, it's risk versus reward, right? We're taking a bigger risk for a certain amount of reward. But they get the guaranteed money because they have the studio and they have that process. They have the ability to put out products, you know, like clockwork. And yeah, they can put out 36 pages of errata, but that's because it's almost expected of them to do so if it's needed. So kind of feel bad for them in a way because there is that expectation. Also, don't feel bad for them, though, because they can put out products every six months in some cases. And it gets very complex very quickly when you start feeling those things all at once. I think I still prefer doing it indie style. I never did have that desire to work for WotC because I don't like having people scream at me. Even a little bit. I, I tend to get a little angry and scream back because. Uh uh-uh. uh, Mama, don't play that. <laughs> Which is fair, and also you're a woman who exists in the time of the internet. Yeah. So like, you're gonna get enough people screaming at you from the internet. Unfortunately. Yeah, like, yeah I had somebody have a meltdown uh, about me calling them out about their their shit 
because they, they were being very hypocritical and I called them out about it and they had a meltdown. It's like, dude, block you, me. You, you made the choice. Like, you're here in 4K being the fool. Like, I, I don't know what you want from me. I, I'm just bringing the flashlight to the party at this point. I got a flashlight. I'm good. Let's go. Literally, the only time I've had any negative interaction surrounding either was when I first released it. And I can remember somebody coming in and using my announcement post as a point to promo their own podcast. Yeah, uh, I have had, I have, ex- I have seen people do that. I can always call them out on it because it's bullshit. Yeah, like if the person is asking for promo, like saying, hey, promo yourself in the thread, do it by all means. But if they're not asking, it is very clearly like a thing for their own thing. Don't do it. Just it's don't. True. And then, you know, it started a whole interaction that did not go very well. Um, And at one point, I just responded. I was like, explain to me why you are important enough to me for me to care about your opinion. Like, on a personal level, why, why should I invest in your opinion as a person right now? Who are you to me? Are you my father? Are you my uncle? Like, what is the relationship here? And I never got a response. Because they um, don't want to admit that their opinion is worthless. Yeah. Exactly. Like, if you're going to give an opinion like that, especially when it comes to somebody who's creating content, self-evaluate whether or not your opinion actually matters. And that sounds harsh. But, like, do you know the person personally? Do they have a reason to put any stock in your opinion? Or are you just going to be one more asshole commenter? Right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's and- like, my dad used to always tell me when I was growing up because I was very much I hate saying it but I was the tomboy I I was one of the dudes I grew up on a farm in a small town and I worked a farm so that that should give you enough of, of the background and he'd always tell me don't accept opinions of somebody you wouldn't go to for advice Exactly. And that that's how and if I'm not going to you for advice, I don't give a damn what you think about what I'm doing. I'm doing what pleases me. Yep. And I learned that because of creative writing workshops. I I went my undergrad and my master's were both in creative writing. And those are always done in workshop forums. And the hardest lesson to learn in those workshops is is this feedback useful? Because Everybody is supposed to give you feedback, but as a person who is getting inundated with people looking at you and saying, hey, this doesn't work, or in some cases, hey, this is bad, it gets really tough to see the forest for the trees sometimes. And so the one thing you got to learn is, okay, is this bad because I wrote it poorly, or is this bad because it's not what they wanted to see? And on the on the same token, right, you've got a product now, Ether, and several others, but let's just take Ether. It, it's 70 pages of PDF or whatever, and we, mm-hmm. you know, we've got Hope Horizon, that's 90-something pages of PDF. We throw that out in the void and you know, maybe charge money for it or, or whatever, but it's a consumable product. And so you're going to come back and say, okay, yeah, this product sucks. All right, where's your 70 page product? Where's your 90 page product? Show me. Show uh-huh. me what's good. Exactly. Oh, you don't have one? Or in that case of. And, and like, I, I imagine there would be some audacity to the point where people would respond with, oh no, this is good. And then I would have a litany of reasons why, okay, but my game isn't that. So why did you come to my game expecting that when that already exists? Yep. Like, why aren't you just playing that? You say this is good, so, you know, all that stuff. And people don't acknowledge the fact that, like, things are made with an audience in mind. We don't just create, I I hate to say it, but none of us create for the sake of creating. None of us do. There's always an ulterior motive to create something, whether it's to make money off it, just to get the idea out of your head. There's always an ulterior motive. For me, 
I knew my audience from the start. My audience was my immediate play group. And then my audience expanded to include other people who play games the way my play group does. So because I know who my audience is, if someone comes in saying this is bad, the first question I'm going to ask them is, okay, what doesn't do what you were expecting it to? Because, in my opinion, the game page, all the information that's out there about it, should set an expectation. And if you think it sucks, my first question is, was that expectation met? If that expectation wasn't met, why wasn't it? If that's because you didn't read any of the stuff about my game and didn't know anything about it and opened it up expecting it to be Warhammer 40k, well, you're going to be disappointed. I'm sorry. Like, what do you want from me? There's only so much I can do when you are expecting Warhammer 40k and you're getting Ether or a PBTA game or D&D 5e. Or even in reverse, there's only so much I can do if you're expecting a rules like game and you're getting Warhammer 40k as a as like an actual war game experience. Yeah. So you got to know who your audience is when you're creating. And you also got to know, at least have a vague idea of who your audience isn't. Because then you also need to be able to deal with the people who aren't your audience coming in and tell you your shit sucks. I, that's a lot I, easier to deal with because usually that's just a okay hi yeah pretty much <laughs> like i i don't want to get too vulgar on here because t- t- terms of service but um actually bro- we uh marked our channel as adults only so uh fair enough but i think my grandfather's favorite line would still break to you <laughs> <laughs> uh unfortunately um, but my grandfather had a line for people like that, and it was not charitable in the slightest. Um, I, my on. dad probably had a had a similar line. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll DM it to y'all. Uh, actually, that hold works. on, that works. Let me uh, let me get up our group chat here. So yeah, that's and that's part of what we try to do when we're writing like our critiques what we actually think could be improved, not just, oh my god, this sucks, but where we think improvements can be made. More as a... a... Well, yeah, that's pretty much what my dad would say. Yeah, Yeah, it sounds like your grandpa... It sounds like my grandfather and your dad were cut from the same cloth. Um, But yeah, like, there's also a thing of, okay, is this feedback going to help me do what I want to do? Because a lot of feedback is really good, but just not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So like, I like, can't say that my feed, feedback is going to be helpful because you only, only you know where you're going to be taking Aether in the future. I can state that this is what my feedback and what my thoughts are. Josh yeah. Can say that it's what his thoughts are. But we can't say, oh, yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to tell you exactly what. To... No, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way, because at the end of the day, it's an opinion. And a great example is from the review you wrote, um, you mentioned wanting more play examples. And I actually laughed because you hit on the one thing I suck at. Uh, <laughs> play examples did not exist in earlier versions of the game because for some reason, my brain does not want to wrap around them. They take. 90 to 100 percent more time than any other element of the game for me to write yeah but i don't know why I just you know everybody's got to have their faults somewhere and that's just my tripping point i guess um so i had a really you good advice on that one if you'd like it if you don't uh, like it it's fine, but i can give you advice on that one because it's something that i have had to use sure please when you're running your game Take notes of what they're doing. I do my best. And that's another part or, where... Or have one of your players take notes. So one of the, the incorporations that I'm going to be doing is that they took a lot of notes. And I took a lot of notes when I was playtesting Hope's Horizon to expand the setting. And so the, the examples that are going to come in are not the mechanical examples because I don't like mechanics very much and cypher isn't really a mechanic heavy system anyways 
the the new one that we're building is going to be mechanic heavy. It, 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 I promise. <laughs> but it, it's just examples of dialogue. Oh, that's I fair. Thing. Okay. This is what we need to do. This is what I need to see from you. How are you going to do it? The examples I have in the players portion right now are ones that I wound up pulling from the streamed playtest that I did, actually, and conversations I had with the players about how they wanted to make their characters and things like that. So those ones were a bit easier for me to write once I had the playtesting done. But uh, you mentioned having more in the GM section, and like I'm kind of turning my brain to that slowly now. And it's just really interesting because like suddenly that's a self-examination thing of like, oh gosh, I'm like the only person that's run this game so far. So all of these examples are going to be me. That's not a bad thing. That's, it's not a it bad is, thing, but it's very strange. And and I wonder, so the way you're talking about it, it kind of makes me think that you recorded those. You said you were you streamed them. I'm assuming you transcribe some of it from the stream. Yeah, I I have the VODs up on YouTube. Actually, I would I would do the same thing with the GM examples if you've got some good content in there, and that's really what I intend to do when we do our system is to record all the playtest streams so that we can mine that for um, yeah dialogue. great idea play for pitfalls for whatever yeah i'm gonna have to that's a fantastic idea to see we're mm. helpful <laughs> <laughs> no like i cannot tell you how many times i've lost sleep over not being able to come up with play examples for the narrator section it's just a tough thing for me so having ideas like that is absolutely wonderful um and that's another thing too is like you're gonna run into problems mm-hmm. designing a game that's inevitable. Nothing will ever go perfectly smoothly, no matter how well you think you're doing. The difference is know what's a problem and know what actually just accomplishes what you wanted to accomplish. Um, that was one reason why I changed core resolution was because I originally had a slightly math heavier core res, but the problem wasn't for the player side. The player side, the core resolution was really fun, but it was too heavy on the narrator side where it was just too much to track, in my opinion. Actually, you know, using me as a baseline example. So instead, I looked at it and I was like, all right, how do I trim this down on the GM side? Well, I couldn't do that without changing core resolution, because before there was a defense stat, and it would be a draw-off between players' cards and the defense stat of the creature, or vice versa. And the damage you dealt was actually, you know, the difference in the sum between the two. So you would add up your cards' values and their cards' values, and if you played higher, you dealt damage to them, and vice versa. So you could fail an attack, and if like you failed that attack, you were having damage dealt to you, which was a really fun system. But the amount of math required was slowing combat turns down. And then when you hit the GM side of things, where they'd be running six, seven, ten different creatures, it became a lot. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it's like, all right, players have one character they're running where they're playing three or four cards, adding them up and blah, blah, blah. I'm running like 10 different creatures, potentially all with different defense stats, potentially taking multiple attacks in their turns. That's that's a lot of math for me to do as one person. And of course, I could have had it a rule where like you shuffle that responsibility off to players or whatnot. Sure. Or instead, I just change core resolution to say, all right, the player decides their success or failure. These are the consequences accordingly. And all of a sudden, no defense stat. All of a sudden, the math becomes easier. It still has the same impact, and you're still playing the same amount of cards. It's just now it's a bit more straightforward. And so, yeah, you're going to run into issues. You're also going to run into things that you think are problems that no one else will think is a problem, but it bothers you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know my pain I can, I can see it yeah. <laughs> no it has to be this way no one's gonna care I care <laughs> you wanna know what that was for me getting encounters to run off of a single sheet of paper front and back I've had that goal since day one of writing Ether, and I didn't take until 
five versions later to figure it out. Because I just thought it wasn't possible. After a while. The amount of looks Joe had is throwing your way right now when you aren't looking is hilarious. The joys of having your, your business partner being your wife. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just, just the weight of knowledge I see resting on Joya's shoulders right now. Well, it, it's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We understand. We, we, we understand your pain. And, like, it's by no means a bad thing. I sound a bit like I'm complaining. I'm really not, because it's the most fun puzzle and problem solving I could do right now. But God, sometimes you don't want to pu solve a puzzle in a day. Like, sometimes you just don't have the brain for it, so it gets there. But it's it takes a while. And I don't think anybody really understands, like, the time or the lifespan of making an indie tabletop game. You know, I so had a year doing it themselves. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I had a year of work into Ether before I released it. It was a lot. And then I did a year's worth of work after I released it before I'm willing to crowdfund it. So, like, it, it becomes a point where, yeah, it's been out for a year, but, like, this has been a solid two years of my life for a project in the middle of doing a master's degree. God knows I put more work into this than I did my thesis. Uh, which I probably... Shouldn't admit that live on the internet, but uh, um, <laughs> and none of my professors are watching. It's fine. We heard nothing. <laughs> well, you don't uh, know that. <laughs> I mean, they could be, but I, I've had some weird people show up on our Twitch to talk to us. Yeah, it happens. It's all right, um, it's all right though. No, I, I'm pretty positive none of my professors would watch. They're all old white British dudes. They wouldn't care about tabletop games. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was really rude. But, like, okay. I, the old white British dudes line is something that has stuck with me from my undergrad because I had um, a queer professor who always... Uh, made fun of a specific tone that new writers use a lot, where they're trying to sound like the classics. They're trying to sound like the people who they venerate as writers. And so there was a fun thing where she would write uh, OWBD on the top of your page or next to a paragraph, and it always meant old white British dude, because that was the voice it sounded like. So now That's that hot. line is just stuck in my brain. And then I wound up doing my master's degree via a online program in the UK. So all of my professors were old oh. British students. <laughs> and I'm like, I was sitting through most of my courses, especially when I started getting feedback from the workshops for my degree. And I was like, oh God, this professor's voice is in my head. Oh no, I can't say this. But I want to. Because it would have just uh it would have been so insulting straight up, but it happens. Um, it's awesome. Oh yeah, the the weird things that stick with you over the years. Now, I um, I will state that I have played TTRPGs with an old white British dude, but he was not mentally culpable. I'm gonna leave that out there. He was a bit out there. That was a that like, was a very polite way to say it. <laughs> it was a very polite way to say it. Uh, I'm gonna have to remember that. Um, he he was a he was a wonderful player. He did a great job, but every time he talked, I would have to stifle. I would have to mute my mic because it made me laugh because he sounded like he was trying. So this was back when I still lived in Texas, and I had, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I do still have a bit of my southern accent. But I back then I was very Texan, and he sounded like this British guy that was trying to talk Texan, and it was not okay. <laughs> it was acting. oh lord, that's hilarious. <laughs> it, like, it you, you know you 
can talk in your normal voice. And he's like, but I'm trying to make you comfortable. I'm I'm good. Honest. Please stop. The fun the funny part for me is when you the like you just kind of pick up an accent without realizing it. Um so for me, one of my players is like born and raised in Ireland. And he has slowly lost a lot of his heavier accent playing with a bunch of Canadians and Americans. But I started picking up his vowels and his R's, and it was really, really strange. And it just happened by accident. But we just sort of like, there was me with my, you know, vaguely American, very Americanized Canadian accent, and him with his Irish accent just going like this slowly. <laughs> and, you know, it never got too extreme, but it still happened, and it was really funny. And there was a point where, like, it got more noticeable because there was a time where this group and I were playing two games a week together. So that was like six to 12 hours of time spent with these people in a week. And it was a lot like, don't get me wrong. I love them, but you really start to notice everybody picking up each other's habits after that. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, no, it's, it's still fun. <laughs> they haven't got sick of me jamming for them yet. So. They might actually just got the Korra campaign. I was going to say, there's, what, four years ahead? That's not bad. Uh, five, actually. Five. So it's five players and me. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. it's a good group, and I'm, I'm really excited. This is also the first time, uh, well, technically second time, because this streamed game happened. But this is the first time for 1.5 that we've had a campaign specifically built for the system. Um, before when I was running playtests and things, it was either for an older version or they were porting characters over from D&D, which worked, but eh, still a little, still a little jank. Yeah, there always will be. D&D is surprisingly difficult to port into other systems that don't use D&D as a framework like Pathfinder. Um, I was shocked, actually, at how well, but also how difficult it was to bring characters from D&D to either. Um, in those initial playtests. And I don't know why. It's just, uh, I think D&D is one of those things where, like, its structure is built on a lot of very classic ideas of games, but it has so much of its own design language because it's been around for so long that it just does not want to translate. That makes sense. That makes yeah. a lot of sense, actually. It's just weird, like... How how many times in a day do you think of where the term advantage came from? Advantage or disadvantage? Like, that is almost strictly a D&D thing. Yeah. In terms of just language that we use. Um, Natural 20 is another one, too. It's almost strictly D&D, but... It, critical it, fail. Critical fail. Like, these things that have leaked into other systems, but are design language specifically from D&D, and from so many people starting with D&D, making their own systems as well. I don't know, it's something I've never actually thought about before tonight, but it's it'd be really fun to see somebody do like an etymology of certain game terms and see how they tie back. Um, sorry, my English nerd is coming out. <laughs> um, I'm not I'm not a linguistics geek. I never have been. I'm much more of the the story and writer geek, but I'm always fascinated by the people who do linguistics work and etymology work because they just they apply a science to something that very much does not want to be a science, and it fascinates me. But I think that's uh, enough of me rambling, and I'm actually starting to lose my voice a little bit. Well, that's probably a fairly good note to end on, then. And yep. So I it's guess. 10 o'clock. We're at an hour and a half, and i um, been having fun chatting with Eldritch Crow. The author of Ether. Yep. Yes, that sounded weird. Um, <laughs> you can go find it on itch.io here. Um, go check it out. It's fantastic. Um, it's a neat heroic fantasy uh, card based tabletop role playing game. Um, there's some other stuff out there on his page, supplements for it, other things um, that you can check out as well. Um, so please go 
go have fun with that. Um, as far as us, we're Angels Citadel. I'm <laughs> Josh, and uh, this is Joanne. And you can chase us around the internet at uh, those links there. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to shout out? I do. I have two things I want to shout out. Um, right. Creators, actually. Uh, I mentioned him earlier. Um, the creator of Tidebreaker, a system that was a huge influence on Ether's design. Uh, his name is Nick Butler, at Fall on My Blade on Twitter. Um, go check it out. Go check out Tidebreaker if you want a really slick superhero system. It's It's got all the meaty, like, crunchy bits I've always wanted out of a system that lets me build my own superpowers. But Nick is just so good at designing mechanics and things that like it has its own design language to it it's absolutely wonderful to experience and then i also want to shout out um uh an orient uh at an orient gd who is you know a player in ttrpg spaces but i was actually watching his stream earlier and he's run into a little bit of trouble lately so if you want to go you know kick him some support via ko-fi that would be appreciated awesome He's a wonderful voice in the space. He's very welcoming. His streams are a lot of fun, and uh, he could just use some financial support right now. So yeah, please go check that out as well. Um, wonderful. We are back after the holiday. Yep. We are every Sunday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, right here, um, for another lounge. We'll talk about role-playing games and maybe have some people join us. Mm-hmm. If they and don't they forget to. Friday Night Halo. We have Friday Night Halo. That's running out. Yeah, we're almost done with Halo. We're almost done with Halo. We're going to start uh, Grim Dawn. Yes. Oh, I love Grim Dawn. We just, we just got it. I was yeah, doing a, a modded run on it with a friend. It's a so lot we, of fun. we had fun with Diablo 3 together. Yes. And this was something that we found that was kind of one-off, you know? So. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about gonna... this after stream. I'm going to make recommendations. <laughs> um, and then every other Sunday is Invisible, is Invisible Sunday. Sunday. 3 p.m. here, I run the Soul's Direction. So, All right. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate each Thank and every you. one of you. And uh, from our Citadel to yours, happy gaming. Happy gaming.